Uh, I would like for you to turn, if you brought a Bible, to the book of Isaiah this morning, chapter 11. Isaiah 11 is our, our text. Now, you know, I'm continuing today in the series of messages that we started uh, on the book of Revelation and uh, the end times. The last couple of weeks I've been dealing with the millennial kingdom of Christ. This is what we've been praying for. Thy kingdom come. We've been praying, the church has been praying for 2,000 years. Lord, thy kingdom come. And before that, this millennial kingdom has been prophesied, predicted, proclaimed by the prophets for another thousand years or so. So you'll be able to bear with me if I speak one more week on the millennial kingdom of Christ, right? I mean, it's so highly anticipated. We can give it a few weeks attention, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. That's, this is what we're looking forward to. The Lord's coming, His, His new, uh, soon return, and uh, He will Himself establish His kingdom on earth. The kingdom of Christ from which He will reign and rule, over which He will reign and rule for a thousand years, according to the book of Revelation chapter 20. And we will go to Revelation 20, just not yet. But I want to read... Uh, right here in chapter 11 of Isaiah. You know, Isaiah spoke a lot about the millennial kingdom of Christ. He spoke quite a bit, as did Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Amos and Joel and uh, Zechariah. They all spoke about this coming millennial kingdom. In chapter 11 of Isaiah, in verse 1, Isaiah, by the Spirit of God, says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, Jesse, father of David, king of Israel, uh, the whole message here is that Messiah would come in that, in that royal lineage of David. Verse 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, unlike the prophets of the Old Testament where the Spirit of God would visit them uh, momentarily or uh, temporarily upon the Messiah, the branch, the Holy Spirit, well, remains in him. And uh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And then we have this sevenfold manifestation of the Spirit. Uh, that equates to the seven spirits of God that we read about in the book of Revelation. But it speaks here of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, and of course the spirit of the Lord, and, it sh and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, in the reverence, reverence of God. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. That is, when the judge comes, when the kingdom is established, Christ, who will preside over this kingdom, will not judge merely by outward appearances. He will not merely judge by what the eye sees outwardly. See, men judge outwardly. We make assumptions uh, and judgments just by what we see. So the well-dressed we give them a pass. The poorly dressed, we're suspicious. Uh, the rich, they're okay. Uh, the poor, you better watch your wallet. So this, this is the, the way human beings are, but this judge is not going to judge merely by appearances. You see, he sees beyond what you're wearing. He sees who you are. He sees what you are. He sees the thoughts, intents, and motives of every heart. And notice verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So when he comes, that's how he's going to judge the armies of Antichrist. He speaks 
death. Just as he spoke life, he spoke let there be, and there was. Well, when he speaks death, the enemies of Christ are going to die. But notice verse 4, with righteousness shall he judge the poor. Well, won't that be nice? Because the poor don't always get a lot of righteousness in judgment. He will reprove with equity. I love that word, equity. Because it speaks of what is right. In fact, the word itself means a level place. It means a level field. That's equity. This is when the poor man is not looked upon with disfavor. And the rich man is not looked upon with favor. Remember, the Lord is no respecter of persons. Don't get the idea, don't let it even enter into your mind that the kingdom of Christ will be anything at all like this kingdom that we live in now. It will be nothing, nothing like it. You see, there's going to be this great word, equity, a level field. You know today, our system, even though I believe it's probably the best system on the earth, is so broken, is so not equitable unequitable if you're poor and you're accused of a crime you go into jail if you're rich and you're accused of a, a crime you post bail is that fair well there's coming a day of equity when the field is level in fact, this kingdom that's coming is so far different than the kingdom that we have now that it doesn't, it doesn't even compare. Verse 5 says, Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Remember, righteousness, faithfulness, uh, all of this characterizing Christ in Revelation 19 and verse 11. You know, he saw this white horse. And the one who sat on it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does he judge and make war, the Bible says. Well, here he is again. Notice verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Now, what kind of a world is that? The lion cub or the bear cub lays down next to the young calf and the child plays with them all. Verse 7, And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den, the cockatrice's den. No poisonous serpents, no fear of wild animals or, or wild beasts, lions eating straw. Verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign, a banner, a signal, a flag, a standard for the people. And, it, and to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest, his rest shall be glorious. A thousand years of peace, a thousand years of blessing, a thousand years of under the just and equitable government of the sovereign King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how many things will change. <laughs> All of earth changes. The climate of earth changes. 
In fact, uh, we'll probably look at a few things uh, concerning that before we're done. But we already know the Bible has said mountains will be leveled in many places and islands will vanish and uh, deserts will give life. uh, The topography of the earth will change significantly. The curse is uh, removed. Longevity is restored. Plants and flowers flourish, fertility of the ground, fertility of animals. All all of these things are restored to to their original grandeur and glory and beauty. The devil is bound for a thousand years and all of his demons with him. Of course, as, as the kingdom of Christ is established on earth, the wicked are not allowed to enter. Remember this will... Everybody who goes into the millennial kingdom will be either saved among the living nations, or they will be the already glorified saints. That's the ones who died and were resurrected or raptured and changed. So the saved and the resurrected and glorified dwell together in the millennial kingdom. It'll be an interesting time. I read the objections that some of the amillennialists and so forth, they... You know, they'll tell you, that can't happen. You can't have people in glorified bodies next to people in human bodies, flesh and blood bodies. But the Lord was right next to his disciples for 40 days, ate with them, slept with them, talked with them. If he didn't like it, he'd walk through the walls, uh, come in, go out. He he ascended up to glory, came down. I think those glorified bodies are going to be all right. (laughs) imagine a body impervious to sickness a body that does not age oh we sang that song no one old or feeble anymore (laughs) not over there no one old or feeble anymore what a glorious reunion there will be with all of our loved ones the saints of old We'll recognize them right away. Nobody's going to have to introduce you. You'll be able to go right to them and say, Abraham! Give him a big hug. <laughs> ah, what a world when Christ reigns and rules. A world of pro- productivity. A busy world. A busy world, as we've seen in, in previous studies. It won't be an idle, I-D-L-E, kingdom. But a busy kingdom. A productive kingdom. They'll be building and manufacturing and planting and one thing they won't have hospitals jails police force criminals thieves it would be nice just to not have to be concerned about thieves (laughs) stealing all my copper Uh, and, a, and a perfect economic system, imagine that, praise God. Actual equity, a level field. The poor not disadvantaged, the rich not advantaged. In fact, I'll tell you, I, I can't find anywhere in all of the passage, passages dealing with the millennial kingdom, and, and this is a subject I have studied for many, many years. I've taught on this for 20 years, 25 years. Uh, probably more on this subject than most subjects. I cannot find anywhere where the Bible indicates that there will be people who are wealthier than others in the millennial kingdom. I don't see this disparity in the millennial kingdom like there is in our current economy. You know, the disparity between the rich and the poor. The, the rich who control uh, the vast fortunes and then the poor who, who scrap for the scraps <laughs> for what's left. The, the huge disparity. I don't see that in the millennial kingdom because everybody's going to have everything they need. Everybody's going to be blessed. Everybody will have abundance. Everyone will prosper. Everyone will be employed. And employment won't be some horrible, laborious, terrible thing. You'll like it. Productivity is good. Productivity is a good thing. And you'll like it. Whatever it is you do, 
I hope I fish, but it don't matter, you know. <laughs> Whatever the Lord has for me. I, I won't be a landlord, I know that. God's going to deliver me from that. <laughs> Besides, everybody's going to have their own house. <laughs> <laughs> no evil over there, that's right, no devil. The Lord will be there and the devil won't. How about that? Praise God. Uh, uh, obviously, that won't be a, a capitalistic society. On the other hand, it won't be communist or socialist or a republic. Or Let me tell you what it will be. A theocracy. A theocracy. God reigns. And he will reign personally, the Bible says, from Jerusalem. How about that? Praise God. And, and uh, the Bible also says that the righteous, the saints, the faithful, the overcomers are going to reign with him. Uh, we've looked at some of those passages before. I, uh, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. He's made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign upon the earth. Some are going to reign. In fact, in the book of Revelation, uh, in this letter to the churches, chapter 2 and 3, he promises the overcomers that they'll rule with him with a, a rod of iron. So, look, he's going to rule with equity. The saints, the righteous, are going to reign. In fact, Revelation 20 tells us that the martyrs, even the martyrs from the tribulation period, are going to reign. So... What a reversal this is going to be. You see, in the coming kingdom, a lot of things will be reversed. When the righteous reign? When has that ever happened? Here on earth, uh, in this world, <clears throat> how many times have the righteous stood before the unrighteous? And, and unrighteous judges, wicked judges, wicked courts, cruel uh, despots, uh, greedy, lying, conniving, uh, bribe-taking, corrupt officials have judged and condemned the righteous. How many times? How many Herods? How many Felixes? Uh, how many Festuses and Agrippas and Caesars and Ahabs and Jezebels and uh, with all of their pride and arrogance and haughtiness and greed have condemned the righteous? There's coming a day when all that's going to be changed. You know, the Lord warned His disciples on several occasions. He, he told them, look, they're going to deliver you up to councils. He said, you'll be beaten. You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. But all of that's going to change. The righteous will reign. And guess what? There'll be no bribery. There'll be no corruption. There will be equity. A level field. How about that? A thousand years of new management. The roles are reversed. Praise God. He says, Revelation 2, let me read a verse to you. Listen to this. Verse 26 and 27. And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my Father. Now this is significant because the Lord promises the overcomers, I will cause you to rule over the nations. What, what nations? The living nations during the millennial kingdom. That's the clear promise to overcomers. So it's not going to be there like here. Here you expect the rich to, to have all the privileges. They walk into a courtroom. How you doing, judge? Yeah, how was your golf game yesterday? Yeah, yeah. And now you got to stand across from him. You've been accused by him or denounced by him. And who are you? Who do you have... Uh, Representing you, maybe a public defender who's got 8,000 other cases on his desk and uh, doesn't even know your name or what you're accused of or whatever. But, you know, the point I'm simply making is everything's going to change and there will be equity. 
And, of course, you know, today we live in a world that's still broken and upside down. And you see the wicked sometimes seem like they get away with everything. Uh, here's what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? The saints will judge the world. Yeah. In fact, he goes on and says, you're going to judge angels. What angels would those be? The fallen angels, the rebellious angels. But there's coming a huge reversal. In, in, uh, in Psalm 73, the psalmist was lamenting. He said, you know, my feet almost slipped. I almost stumbled when I was looking at the prosperity of the wicked. How it seems like everything works for them. It seems like no matter how wicked they are, they prosper. No matter what they put their hands to do, it, it goes well for them. And it looks like they're never sick. They never go through trials. And look at me, I'm trying to serve the Lord and I just get one trial after another. And Psalm 73, read the passage. He's talking about the struggle he had within until, he said, I went to the sanctuary of the Lord. And the Lord just, I'm paraphrasing, okay? The Lord reminded me of their end. And their end is not going to be good. But the end of the righteous, well, we've been reading about it. Blessing, deliverance, healing, eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. But the wicked, well, you know, they may flourish just for a moment, though. Just for a moment. The wicked get, you know the old saying, they get their 15 minutes of fame, yeah, their glory. They, all of life might be uh, their 15 minutes, which is nothing compared to eternity where we get to enjoy the blessings and presence of the Lord forever. Y'all with me? Uh, are you still in Isaiah? Look, look with me to chapter 30. Let me read a couple of passages over here. I just like to read these sections that deal with the coming kingdom, the characteristics, the nature of it. He says, uh, Isaiah 30, and beginning in verse 18, And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you. Therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all they that wait for him. We don't feel too blessed when we have to wait. You know, that's what we're doing right now, by the way. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're trusting. We're standing on the promises. We're believing his word. We're going about doing all the things we know we're supposed to be doing. And yet we are waiting. We're waiting for many things. I'm waiting for some prayers to be answered. I'm waiting for some things to just be manifested to my sight. Things that I believe are going to come to pass. I'm waiting for the Lord's return. I'm waiting for that trumpet to blow. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see our loved ones that have gone on before us. And look, the longer we wait, the more loved ones we're going to have up there waiting for us. The longer we wait, the more precious heaven becomes. And the less shine, the less shine this world has. But he says, blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. Look, you may weep now. There may be times of sorrow, but you're not going to weep for long. You're not going to weep forever. While there will be those who will weep forever, you won't be among them. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, you know, that's prison fare. The bread of affliction, waters of adversity, bread of adversity, waters of affliction. We, we all go through it. Look, don't think that Something strange is happening to you because you're going through trials and troubles and afflictions. Everybody goes through it. Don't think God has singled you out. Everybody goes through it. Will you trust Him? That's the question. 
Will you wait patiently? Will you, will you continue to abide? Will you be faithful? And notice he says this. Though we go through those things in this life, it's not going to last for long. And yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but your eyes will see your teachers. Well, you know, in, in biblical times, there were many, many occasions where the righteous teachers, the righteous prophets had to hide. Uh, they couldn't openly preach or proclaim they had to hide, and if people wanted to be taught, you had to find them and seek them out and, and see if uh, you could meet. Look, there's coming a day. We, we enjoy great privileges here in the United States. Other nations don't have this. Uh, many other nations don't, but we can meet openly. We can say who we are and what we're doing. We can put a sign out in front and say, we're a church, and we're going to preach Christ every week, every chance we get. And nobody comes and arrests us. Nobody shoots us. Look, they can't do that in many countries. To be a Christian, you have to meet in secret. You have to assemble in secret. You have to uh, hide. Because these roving bands of marauding, angry Hindus, Muslims, whoever it may be, communists, socialists, they will kill you quickly. He says, And your ears will hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk you in it. When you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left, the Lord will speak to you and guide you and direct you. He says, verse 22, You shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver. And the ornament of thy molten images of gold, you'll cast them away as a menstruous cloth. You'll say unto it, get thee hence. You know, the picture here is Israel had so adopted many of the customs of the heathen nations that they did what people still do in, in heathen cultures. Some even do it here. They will dress their idols and statues with clothing. Expensive clothing, expensive fabric, elaborate clothing, jewels, and so on. They bathe their idols, you know, their statues of silver and gold and stone and so forth. They play music to it. They carry it around in processions. He says, the days ahead, you'll realize just how vile all such things are. And you'll cast them away like a menstruous cloth. And you'll say... Concerning all idolatry of every kind, of every kind, get thee hence. Verse 23, Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that thou shalt sow the ground with it, and bread of the increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall thy cattle feed in large pastures. The oxen likewise and the young asses that ear the ground or that till and work the ground shall eat clean provender which has been winnowed with the shovel and the fan. You won't have to worry about what the cattle eat or what the donkey eats or the ox eats because there's going to be so much. And there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hall hill uh, rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Verse 26, Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold, as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of His people and healeth the stroke of their wound. The picture, of course, is not of a glaring, sweltering sun that's so oppressive, you know, <laughs> but of a glorious light that's brighter than anything we're able to imagine. And even the night, uh, the, the moon will be brighter than our present sun. And this will be a wonderful thing, a glorious thing, uh, not a terrible thing, not a heat and humidity uh, nightmare. No hurricanes, by the way. No hurricanes. <laughs> or tornadoes, or earthquakes, or 
hailstorms or tsunamis and praise God. It's going to be all right. What about, here's an interesting thought. What will worship be like during the millennial kingdom? Uh, what do you think that will be like? Oh, oh, you think they'll have, will, will they have churches in the millennial kingdom? I mean, people are going to live all over the earth. Every corner of the earth people are going to inhabit. Population is going to multiply uh, tremendously with no sickness, no mortality, and productivity and fertility being uh, blessed and abundant. Just think how many kids a woman can have in a thousand years. I mean, one person... I mean, you could have, you could have, you know, you, you could have 900 children. 900 children and maybe four, five, six thousand grandchildren. <laughs> Birthdays are going to be tough, you know. <laughs> Just keeping track of them. <laughs> but what will worship be like during this millennial kingdom? Uh, I'd like for us to consider that a little bit. That we do know, uh, well, here's a few things we know. There won't be any Hinduism there. There won't be any Buddhism there. There won't be any Islam there or any other world religion. Because Christ is the center and focus of all worship. There won't be any cults there. In fact, I don't think there'll be any denominations there. There'll be people from denominations, don't get me wrong, because there are Christians in in, in um, most denominations. But I don't think they're going to have a Baptist church over there and a Presbyterian one over there. It's not going to happen. Uh, but I tell you what they will have there. There will be a temple. And even though Israel is going to get a temple during the tribulation period. That temple and the millennial temple will not be the same. The millennial temple is described in great detail in six chapters of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 40 through 46 is all about the millennial temple and uh, what it's going to be like. It's measurements, it's design, the way it's laid out. It's worship, it's ritual, it's priesthood, it's sacrifices. Six chapters deal extensively with the millennial temple and, and, and everything that has to do it. Six chapters. I'll tell you one thing about the millennial temple. It's going to be humongous, if that's a word. It's going to be huge. Solomon's temple is going to be tiny in comparison to this millennial temple. Solomon's temple, the temple itself, was about, ah, you know, it's pretty small, 30, less than 3,500 square feet. This temple is about a mile square. And the temple environs, as you read about uh, the, the, the size of the temple grounds and uh, uh, Jerusalem around it, it covers about half the present state of Israel. So, again, this is another reason why some of the amillennialists have said, you can't take these passages literally. I mean, if you take Ezekiel 40 through 46 literal, then you've got two big problems. Here's the big problems. Number one, you've got a temple so huge that there's no way it could fit over there. Uh, and the temple grounds... Uh, the land that's given to the Levites is like 50 square miles. The land that Jerusalem sits on is uh, like 2,500 square miles. All of inhabitable Israel right now is probably 4,000 square miles. The, the nation itself is only about 7,000 8,000 square miles. But half of that is the Negev, which is uninhabitable. So... It can't be, they say. It can't be, it won't fit. But you want to remember the topography of the earth changes then. 
The Lord tells us that in Zechariah. I mean, he's going to split Jerusalem. He's going to split the Mount of Olives. Everything's going to change. So that's not a problem. The other problem they raise is this, though. If you take Ezekiel literally, chapters 40 through 46, you can read it at your own, uh, on your own time. I'd like to read the whole section, but just you'll have to do it at home. But if you take that literally, it's a return to Judaism. It means that here we are in a period of, of grace and, uh, and no ritual uh, such as that of Judaism. But you read these chapters, chapter 40, 41, 42, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you've got a temple, you've got a priesthood, you've got Levites, you've got sacrifices, you've got all of the, the pageantry and, and, and ritual, it would seem, of Judaism, and uh, you've got holy days, you've got the Feast of Tabernacles, you've got the Feast of uh, Passover, those things in the millennial kingdom, whereas today to celebrate those things, remember we've studied this on Wednesday night. Paul says, if you go back to this, I'm worried about your salvation. If you're observing these things, he says, I fear I've spent on you labor in vain because those things are a shadow, a shadow of what was to come. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Uh, Galatians 4. You pick up any of Judaism, you're obligated to keep all of Judaism, and you fall under the curse. He says you fall from grace in Galatians. So, to return to those kinds of practices in the millennial kingdom would be absurd, according to the amillennialist. Well, actually... Worship during the millennial kingdom will be similar to Judaism in some respects, but it is absolutely not Judaism. Absolutely not. And uh, I want to point out a couple of things to you that make that very clear. You want to remember, in the Old Testament, the whole idea of the sacrifices was to cover or take away sin. In the millennial kingdom... There will be sacrifices, but they will not be of an expiatory nature. It will not remove sin. They will be of a commemorative nature, much like we do with communion today. It reminds us of what Christ did. That's what the sacrifices will be like. A uh, couple of passages. Zechariah, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn with me to Zechariah, or you can just listen. I'm going to read a passage. In Zechariah chapter 6. Y'all y'all awake? All right. Zechariah 6, just a couple of verses. The temple in Jerusalem will serve several functions in the millennial kingdom. It's going to be uh, the center of God's government. Actually, God is going to govern the earth from the temple. It'll be the center of the divine government, but it'll also be the place where God manifests His glory in a very powerful and unique way. And all the inhabitants of the earth are going to want to go to Jerusalem to worship there. Uh, in Zechariah 6, I'm going to read a few verses beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> and... Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, of course, this is Messiah, he shall grow up out of his place, he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now, this does speak of Christ, Messiah, he's going to spring up out of Israel. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now here's an interesting passage, because the one who builds the temple sits in the temple and rules from the throne in the temple. So the temple is a center of government, and he's a priest upon the throne. And the Council of Peace 
That is, both offices, both king and priest, will be united in him. That's never been done before. No king was a priest. But here you have king and priest united in this one. And uh, the various crowns, verse 15 says, And they that are far off, that speaks of the Gentile nations, they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. He's going to rule from the temple. Uh, so king and yet priest, both offices united, and all the Gentile nations coming willingly, joyfully, uh, for the privilege of playing a role in the building of this temple, actually. In chapter 8, I want to read another passage, right here in Zechariah, chapter 8. These are little glimpses. You know, this is the way prophecy works. The study of prophecy is rather unique in that you'll be reading a passage that deals with a specific place or person, uh, and, uh, and then suddenly... The spirit of prophecy carries the prophet away to a future time and a future place. And the next, the very next verse will be all about something that's uh, going to take place in the millennial kingdom. So that's, that's the way prophecy is. In chapter 8 and verse 20, Thus says the Lord of hosts, that it, it shall yet come to pass, that there shall come people... And the inhabitants of many cities. Now this is, he's talking here about many people. He's talking about the nations of the world. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, Let us go up speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men will take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we've heard that God is with you. You know, uh, interesting word here, it's Yahweh Shema. The Lord is there, the Lord is present. Uh, the idea being that Judaism, which has been despised by the world, or the Jews, the Jewish people despised by the world, will now be recognized to have divine favor. And the world will acknowledge it. All the world will acknowledge it. That they did have a special place in God's economy and always will. And uh, we will always be the privileged of the Gentiles. You're not a Jew. Being a Christian doesn't make you a Jew. It does make you a child of God. And just as much a child of God as any other child of God. And we will ourselves rejoice and, uh, and have the privilege of worshiping side by side with those of all the nations of earth, the one Lord, the one King, the one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And do you know that day is not that far away? Amen. Isaiah 65, I'm sorry, Isaiah 66 and verse 23, it says, All flesh will come and worship the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Well, let me give you real quick, because uh, we're out of time here just about, and I really want to get on to chapter 21. <laughs> so... So, uh, let me give you real quickly three purposes of the Millennial Temple. There are three purposes that God has for building this Millennial Temple. Number one, it's going to provide a dwelling place for the divine glory. In, in Ezekiel 30, uh, 43, Ezekiel 43 and verse 7, uh, God calls the temple in that verse, the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. A place for the divine glory to inhabit. That's one purpose for the temple. Second, it will be to provide a center for the divine government. 
because also in Ezekiel 43.7, God calls the millennial temple the place of my throne. So he will govern, he will rule the world from Jerusalem, uh, from that temple. And then third, uh, that temple will perpetuate uh, a memorial sacrifice. All the sacrifices of the millennial kingdom will be commemorative. They will be memorials. They will declare that salvation was accomplished. Just, just like we take communion and we declare this is what this commemorates. What Christ did. Well, uh, you know, that, that will be true then too. So, uh, Here's something else to consider. You know what? Turn with me quickly to Revelation 20. I told you we were going to go there, right? All right. Revelation 20, you, you had a warning, so you knew we were going to get there eventually. Revelation 20, I do want to read a couple of verses here before I finish with chapter 20. Remember, we've been studying about the thousand years uh, the devil, verse 2, is bound for a thousand years and he's not going to be loosed until the thousand years would be fulfilled. Uh, verse 4 speaks about those who lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not live until after the thousand years were finished. That's the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has a part in the first resurrection. On them the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years. Over and over we're told about this thousand year period, this millennium. That's what it means. A millennium means a thousand years. So for a thousand years Christ reigns and rules. And during that thousand years, remember, only the saved go into the millennial kingdom. But during that period of time, during that thousand years, millions... Billions of people will be born. Nobody is born saved. Nobody is born saved. Now, we're talking about the living nations. Those who are in resurrected bodies, glorified bodies, are not going to be marrying and having babies. But the living nations will be reproducing, and the billions of people will be born, and you're not born automatically saved. You have to get saved. And you're living in a perfect paradise type kingdom. The devil is not present. The opportunity to sin is not really available. You don't really have these opportunities. It's not that there will be no sin or no inner rebellion, but when there is rebellion, it's quickly crushed. It's speedily uh, uh, dealt with. And so there's no real opportunity for rebellion. But after the thousand years, that's going to change. Because the Bible tells us in verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So after a thousand years of blessing and provision and productivity and fruitfulness, the presence of the Lord and the glories of God, the devil is released and nobody, nobody would pay any attention to him after that. Except verse 8 says that he shall go out to deceive the nations that are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. It, it shows you that here is human nature. Even when in paradise conditions... Blessed beyond measure, they look for opportunities to sin. And when the opportunity presents itself, they'll take it. When they're given the opportunity to rebel, vast, vast multitudes will rebel. Certainly not everybody, but multitudes like the sand of the sea, the Bible says. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city. Now, you know, you'd think the devil would learn. He's tried that before. And it didn't work out. But he's going to try it again. 
And he doesn't have any trouble leading a vast multitude with him. Uh, And fire comes down from God out of heaven and devoured them. I mean, that's how swiftly, quickly the Lord deals with this rebellion. And the devil, verse 10, that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Remember, this is the place that Jesus said was prepared for the devil and his angels. And he'll get the place that's prepared for him. Where the beast and the false prophet are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. So when the devil is released, he'll tap right in to a huge pent-up demand for opportunities to sin. And being the shrewd marketer that he is, he feeds that demand and uh, people are looking for opportunities for self-indulgence and self-gratification and all all these other wicked uh, desires that have been pent up. You know, even during the millennial kingdom, people will have to be saved. They'll have to be born again. Uh, They'll have to commit their lives to Christ or not. And obviously, multitudes will not. Now, those, let me just make sure you understand, those who are, who died and are resurrected, or those who are raptured, they're impervious to sin. It's no, no temptation. They're not going to backslide. They're not going to fall. Uh, they're not going to rebel. They are saved. They're with the Lord for all eternity. This is the living nations during the millennial period. I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Because you, you, you know, don't think you mean you mean once I die, I, I, I still have to go through all of this. No, uh, it's all over. It's all over. You graduated. Uh, you get to take off mortality and put on immortality. You you pass. Praise God. And then you know the truth will finally be revealed. The truth is that people want to sin. They do. They want to sin. And uh, they'll jump at any opportunity to do so. It's part of our, our wicked nature. And the Lord will deal spe- speedily with it and crush it. And then, then comes the eternal state. The eternal state uh, where there will never, ever again be any unrighteousness, no devil, no sin, no violence or pollutions of any kind. And we'll look at that in the next couple of chapters of the book of Revelation. Mankind will, I guess, be shown to see what he is in fact. You know, we can blame our wickedness on a lot of things. We can say, well, you know, it's because I grew up poor. The reason I'm a criminal is because I grew up poor. Well, people in the millennium, what are they going to say? They had everything, and they're still going to rebel. You won't be able to say it's because I was poor. You're not going to be able to say it's because, uh, you know, I, I was with a bad crowd. Uh, I mean, look, Adam was put in paradise, Adam and Eve. And still, given the opportunity, they took it. Well... The best thing to do is to make sure that you have committed your life to Christ and you keep your life committed to Christ and that you don't lose sight of the fact that this world's quickly over and that any sinful uh, pleasures and enticements that this world offers come with a price tag, a very, very hefty price tag a price tag you don't want to pay. Far, far better to commit your life to the Lord and pray for the grace to stay committed to the Lord and obedient to the Lord and submitted to the Lord. Father, we pray today for that very thing. We know, Lord, that you extend to us this grace. I I pray, Lord, for everyone hearing my voice today. Lord, whatever excuses we've made to excuse 
to justify why we have not committed our whole heart or our whole life to you. Lord, strip away all such things. Let everyone see those excuses for what they are. Lame excuses. And Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one to commit their whole life and whole heart to you. To call upon you as Savior. To ask you for forgiveness. To believe in you as Lord and Master and King who died on a bloody cross for our sins and rose from the grave. And Lord, to commit, to commit our lives, our hearts, our homes, our all to you. Lord, I pray for every single person hearing my voice. Lord, that they would commit 100% to you. Take us, Lord. Take our all. All we are. All we have. Save us, forgive us, change us. Make us yours. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.